conversation uh, on Ghana tonight on this matter because if you recall on Friday Alexander Penyo Makina indicated that there was really no need for the minister to appear well on the powers in parliament earlier today there's a member of parliament in that area who has a few responses to the national security minister stay with us as always we are very interactive connect with us the hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook and Twitter let's get talking Well, let's settle for Ghana Bridge. The National Security Minister has condemned the attack on the national security operatives by residents of Garu and Timpani in the Upper East region. One person died with several others hospitalized after the national security operatives were allegedly attacked. After some twists and turns on whether the minister should appear before parliament upon summons, Albert Kandapa says the perpetrators must be condemned. The House will agree with me that the attack on the national security personnel and also the Garu, Garu police station was reprehensible and must be condemned in no uncertain terms. Mr. Speaker, in many other jurisdictions, such attacks on security personnel in the course of their legitimate duties would be classified as an attack on the state. The Speaker of Parliament has cautioned Ghanaians against whipping up tribal sentiments and religious divisions as the country prepares for the 2024 general elections. According to Alban Bagbin, the country needs a peaceful environment in which people can freely practice their beliefs and practices without fear of persecutions. He spoke at an event to launch the Ghana Parliamentary Caucus on freedom of religion or belief in Accra. Ghanaians must learn to appreciate and embrace the choices that define others' theological systems, principles, and precepts. Freedom of religion or belief is a fundamental human right that we must cherish and honor. Some residents of Abrafo, Frami, and Najenin communities near the Kakum National Park in the central region have vehemently opposed any attempt to give off portions of the Kakum National Park for mining. The reaction comes at the back of a supposed application by High Street Limited, a mining company, to mine in the Kakum National Park. <laughs> I strongly oppose the idea of mining here. We may end up losing everything. We will be doing the next generation a disservice if we allow this request. Residents and shop owners along the railway line at Jowulusei, they will not vacate the area after being given eviction notice by the Ghana Railway Development Authority. Over 300 private property are involved. The issue of demolition, we, we, we don't understand. So you have permits? We have a um, lease document from them to, to stay. And we have um, operating permits and the AMA, they come here all the time to collect uh, revenue. The family of the late Victoria Dapa, who was murdered at Edum in the Ashanti region, are worried over the strike by Jirios. They fear the continuous absence of the Jirios will unduly prolong the case. We are trying to uh, tell the Jews to help us to you know, squeeze themselves to come and uh, help the family. Because sometimes it can go to your way, it can go to the other way. And at the same time, we are telling the government to, you know, help the jewel to uh, do what they, whatever they want so that they can return to court and help 
de Nidhi. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. Now, this attempt to buy a company, in fact, to mine in the Kakum National Park, I mean, there's a park that a number of us grew up going to visit and see elephants and others just have a free time in, the, in this national park. That company, the High Street Limited, we've been doing some digging into this company. We found something really interesting. So stay with us. My colleague Dennis Barberi Wedam um, has found something really striking uh, here on Ghana tonight. We'll get into it. But coming up next, we have an update on the military brutalities in the Garu area as the National Security Minister has finally broken his silence on the matter. Stay with us. We'll get into it shortly here on Ghana tonight. So, uh, here, f first of all, from the National Security Minister Kandapa, um, he has condemned the attack on the National Security operatives by some of the residents of Gao and, also, and Timpane in the Upper East region. He also condemned the military for the excesses, which led to one person, unfortunately, dying, with several others hospitalized after the, the National Security operatives were alleged to have attack these persons. Now, after some twists and turns on, on whether the minister should appear before parliament upon summons, Albert Kandapa was there earlier today, he says the perpetrators must be condemned. Take a look. Arrival in Garu, the team was besieged by some Irish youth who were armed with weapons including EK-47 rifles, among others. Mr. Speaker, despite initial attempts to introduce themselves as national security personnel, the Irish youth proceeded to attack the officers by firing, a multiple, uh, by firing multiple gunshots at a black Toyota Land Cruiser in which the officers were seated. Mr. Speaker, following an escalation of the attacks on their vehicle, the officers drove to the Garu police station to seek refuge. The Irish youth then pursued the officers and circled the police station and fired multiple shots at sea. The timely intervention of personnel of the Ghana Armed Forces enabled the safe evacuation of the national security personnel from the Garu police station. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, the House will agree with me that the attack on the national security personnel and also the Garu, Garu police station was reprehensible and must be condemned in no uncertain terms. Mr. Speaker, in many other jurisdictions, such attacks on security personnel in the course of their legitimate duties would be classified as an attack on the state. Mr. Speaker, subsequent to all this, on Saturday, October 28, 2023, the Minister of National Security and the Ghana Armed Forces conducted a joint operation in Garu to seize weapons used by the Irish youth groups to attack the national security personnel. So speaker, in the aftermath of the joint operation, reports have emerged in respect of some excesses by the personnel who conducted the operation. Mr. Speaker, this aspect of the matter is currently before the court. It would therefore be inappropriate for me to comment on the matter as it would amount to contempt of court. That said, however, I would like to urge honorable members of the House to please exercise circumspection 
in discussing the matter for some three reasons. First, Mr. Speaker, because of the dire security situation we are confronted with in Boko as a result of the existing ethnic conflict in that area. Second, because of counter-terrorism operations going on in the area. And third, Mr. Speaker, because of the need to not to demotivate and demoralize our state security personnel. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the Honorable House of the continued cooperation and respect for the pieces of advice and guidance that we continue to get from Honorable Members. And I want to thank Honorable Members for the audience. Thank you. Well, so that's Albert Kandapa, the National Security Minister before Parliament earlier today, condemning the attack on the National Security operatives um, and we've been showing you videos of these incidents both that particular incident that led to the joint operation that's left a number of people injured in the Garo and Timpani areas now Kletu Savoka is member of parliament for the Zebela constituency is one of the longest serving MPs in this eighth parliament he is a leader of the caucus of the MPs in the Upper East region or the minority. He's joining us. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to clear this on Ghana tonight. So you wanted the Minister of National Security to come before the House and answer questions on exactly what happened. This statement and the details that is giving, does it address those concerns that you heard about this, this incident? Um, no, the... Uh, the National Security Minister, Orwe Albert Kandapa, was very, very economical with the facts and the truth of the matter. He, his, his statement was very short and did not address the aspects of the issue at stake. Uh, he alleged that the matter, okay, he alleged that um, uh, people attacked national security in Garu. And then they, they only went back there to uh, search for arms, to retrieve arms, and that there were excesses. And then that the, the matter is before court in Accra here. The, it, General, that is what he said. And that it is condemnable to attack national security operatives. That is what basically what he said. He didn't address. Politically, in the first place, he earlier last year introduced the concept of see something, say something. It was in respect or in furtherance of this see something, say something that one or two persons in Garo spotted this car in Garo Township mm -hmm. at an odd hour. The car looks strange because they don't have a car of that nature that in, in the area and at that time. So because of see something, say something, the gentleman went to approach the, I mean, the occupants of the car to find out what they, who they were and what they were doing. They were idling around the church premises of Garu. And they said they were national security operatives. Then he said, are you aware of the police? I mean, are you, is the police aware about you? And then the local security said, no. Then why don't you report to police? He said, they don't know the police station. They said, okay, let me lead you to the police station to report yourselves. So he led them to the police station. At that stage, there was no attack on any of the operatives of the national security. There was no attack of whatever sort. It was when they got to the police station right. that they conducted a search on the vehicle when they, the passengers came out okay. and discovered that there were AK-47 uh, assault weapons, there were ammunition, and then the bulletproof belts, vests, okay. and several other things in the car. That right. alarmed them. Because they, that, that is a security area. Garo is very volatile uh, because of the conflict in Boku and uh, because of the extremist and jihadist activities across the border in Burkina Faso, etc. So that attracted the, the people. And when went around that they had uh, spotted a, a car loaded with weapons in the, in the Garo area. I see. So the, the people came to the police station. But at that stage, the police had taken custody 
of the national security operatives and you put them at the counter back oh, okay. for their safety and for them to conduct uh, a, a uh, investigation you say they, 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 in they the took area. the national security operatives to the counter back the police took them to counter back for their own safety but the national security minister in his presentation or the, the statement he presented before you in parliament said that the national security operatives who were in this vehicle, this V8, which we have videos of, actually ran to the police station for safety when the residents started firing at this V8 that they were in. That's what he said before you in parliament. Alfred, that is certainly not true. They didn't know where the police station is. They were strangers in Garo. So they did not know where the police station is. It is this same uh, Samaritan, good Samaritan, who said that, okay, once you don't know the police station, just follow me. And he rode on his moto and they followed him to the police station. They didn't drive to the police station. If they knew the police station and they got to go, why didn't they go there? Why were they alling somewhere else? So they said they didn't know the police station because they were strangers. So he said, okay, let me lead you to the police station before something happens to you. So he led them to the police station. It was when he got to the police station, they opened the car and came out, that they discovered that there were weapons and ammunition and then the bullet uh, 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 belts around, I mean, in the car. It was in the process of opening the, wanting them to open the boot to see whether there were many more arms and ammunition in the car. That led to the people firing into the car mm -hmm. to make sure that the car did not right. move. And also they deflated the ties to make sure that it didn't run away in the night. And they didn't I, know. I, I, that I was what happened. Uh, 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 right. But, well, Honorable Clarissa Savoca, and we, I'm sure you've asked for some further investigation into this matter. So we're very mindful of the boundaries of this conversation and then also the sensitivities at play because of what you have just referred to, uh, what's happening in the area. But we have videos, and this is not the first time we're showing the video of this, uh, the V8, that was, um, as according to the national security, this V8 belongs to them. And this V8 was, was shot at. We have a video of the V8 with bullet holes in there, in this, in this V8. And we've, we've shown it before, and we're going to put it on the screen right now. So if you're saying that the residents did not attack the V8, but then there are bullet holes in the V8 as we have a picture or a video of exactly what happened. How did this V8 end up with bullet holes in there? I've told you that when they got to the police station and they discovered that there were arms in the vehicle, in the front seat and at the back seat, mm -hmm. the, 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 the youth there said that they should open the boot of the car for them to see whether there were many more arms cached in there or not. It was at that stage when they refused to open the boot that they started firing into the car. And at that stage, there was no passenger in the car. The security operator had disembarked and were with the police at the police station. So nobody was, there was nobody in the car at the time that they were shooting. In any case, if they were shooting and using machetes on all the, 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 the occupants of the car, he should show us any one of them who were injured in the process. You cannot use machetes and then cutlasses and then uh, cordials and what not on people, gunshot wounds on uh, gunshots on the vehicle, on the people, and none of them is injured in the process. He should I challenge him to show us any any of any person, one of the national security operatives who was there, who was injured, to confirm the fact that they were attacked. It is not true that they were attacked. In fact, we should have been commending the Garo people, particularly the two people who met them first and led them to the police station for being very patriotic citizens. And for keeping faith with the concept of see something, say something. What the national security operator, I mean, the operators have done, including the national security minister, is that they have undermined, if not jeopardized, the concept of see something, say something. In fact, they led them peacefully from their hideout to the police station and handed them over to the police. The police will testify. They are not dead. They are there. They will testify as to whether... At the time that the people were firing, the people were in the car and they were firing at them or not. And why nobody was injured in the process? I see. Why? Well, and in any case, 
look at the, the, the retaliation or reaction from the, okay. from the national security and then the, the, the gun armed forces. Does it merit the, 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 the attack, the supposed attack they made on a national security operator of five people? You okay. five people, assuming that was any of them wounded, then you go and beat, brutalize, dehumanize, and humiliate I about see. 150 people. Hmm. Before I let you go very quickly, how about the, the police station in question? Because, and we just want to understand the National Security's narrative, their position on this matter. The minister says that while the operatives were at the police station, the residents sh shot at the police station. Did they explain to you, I mean, the resident explained to you exactly what happened, and that is, if they did indeed shoot at the police station, what was the reason behind that? Alfred, everything depends on evidence. Let's have evidence. That's why we are asking for an investigation into this matter. That's why we are asking for an, uh, uh, a comprehensive investigation into this matter to forestall okay. incidents of this nature in the future. If the Garo police was attacked, there will be bullet uh, uh, marks on the wall of the police station, etc. Admittedly, yes, they shot at the car but not at the police or at the police station all over. No, that did not happen. We, that will depend on evidence. And in any case, I admitted that, what, that, that, is what is, that that is true, Alfred. Um, Boguri is about 15 kilometers away from Garo. Chimpani is about 6, 7, 10 kilometers away from Garo. On the 24th evening, when the, the national security operators were there, they, they, they used to have at the Garo police station, Boguri people and Chimpani people were not involved. They did not know. Why did the nationals? Why, why did the military go to attack Bogure and then Timpani's uh, citizens? He has mm. to answer that question. I why see. did they go to attack them? And in any case, he made a statement that the purpose was to retrieve weapons from these uh, the inhabitants of Garo. Why did you go to Bogure and then Timpani to retrieve weapons when there was no incident that took place in those two villages? In any case, if they went to search for weapons, does it include beating and maiming people? Okay. Does it include uh, taking people's phone, mo mobile phones, and taking money from the citizens of the area? Is it part of the search, cordon and search, and retrieve weapons? And does it include beating and maiming people to the extent that one of our citizens had lost his life? That is okay. why I say that he was very economical with the facts and the truth. Uh, that I, is I why see. I say that there are many more questions than answers in this in, matter. In, in, and indeed. that is why we think that the case might be properly investigated. And I think that's, that's quite clear that all these questions you are asking. But as you make that call for a proper investigation into this matter, have you tabled this to the, the leadership of parliament, maybe for the minister to come back so you have the opportunity to ask? And also, I want to find out what's the state of those who were injured as a result of this joint operation by the military. That led to, we understand, over 50 people being hospitalized in the Garo and Timpani areas. What's happening to them now? Many of them are still in various hospitals in Garo and Boku. Today, as we talk, some of them, they are still languishing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the health, health centers. Some of them are so maimed that they cannot do the work, particularly the physical work of farming that they do in the area. Why? A small boy, six-year-old boy, who uh, is it the assemblyman's son or so, was also beaten. Did he also mount an attack on them? Women were whipped here and there. Did they also mount an attack on them? It was a culture of impunity that they undertook that, 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 that night. And you could see that a helicopter was hovering around. A helicopter hovering around. As if they were dealing with uh, uh, jihadists and the extremists in the area. They were dealing with innocent Ghanaians, and they, they overreacted. And I think that with the greater respect, the National Security Coordinator or Minister, my very good friend, ought to be apologetic, ought to be telling people that we'll take care of your medical base, ought to be telling people that we'll make sure we compensate those of you who were seriously wounded and injured in the process, so that they can then re-establish contact, confidence, trust, and faith between the citizens and then the, 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 between the civilians and then the security personnel or the, the armed forces. We need that, that, that uh, coexistence. We need that confidence. We need that trust. What has happened is growing a wedge between security and civilians, which is very unfortunate.
really appreciate your time uh, joining us and that clarion call you're making for some further investigation into the matter, at least to answer all the questions that you have asked tonight. Thank you. Kletu Savoka is Member of Parliament for the Zebela constituency and uh, of the longest serving MPs in this eighth parliament. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. And coming up next, the attempt to, to mine in the Kakum National Park has ignited that conversation on the need to protect forest reserves from illegal mining. But the bigger question we're asking tonight is, how did we get here, really, to, the, to this point where even a mining company would even have the thought of applying for a mining license to mine in the Kakum National Park? What exactly led to th this particular emboldenment, the motivation, the drive to even want to do this? And here's where we lay the foundation into a very, very interesting conversation tonight. We know a bit more about the mining firm in question, High Street Limited. They are well known in the minerals and mining sector from what we gathered. In fact, because information on the Minerals Commission's own web website gives us a bit more detail, plus some information that we have also gathered from other sources that we employed about this particular company. My colleague, Dennis Parberi Wadam, has been looking into the, the details of these documents that we've got exclusively here on Ghana tonight. Dennis, what did we find? Well, so many have been asking if... Um this particular company is a newcomer in the space, but mm. our checks show that the company has been in existence, at least per information available on the uh, Minerals Commission website. It's been incorporated, or it, it was incorporated, as far back as 2016, as you can see. 2016? Um, 2016, yes, with the following details, where they operate from. And, uh, but what is interesting is what exactly they've been doing and the kind of license they, they, they hold mm -hmm. and what they do in certain areas of the country. So when you check um, for 27th of June 2023, what they hold is a, is a prospecting license. It okay. is still active and that is to prospect for gold and other minerals in the Ashanti region and the Kumasi district. Right. When you check on the 22nd of um, November 2022, mm -hmm. they got a prospecting license that is still undergoing validation and that is in respect of lithium, gold and other minerals. That is in the central region. So they've already put in a prospecting license uh, application for lithium. Yes. Lithium. Which we are yet to start mining. Interesting stuff. So, yes, they hold quite a number of licenses. So you have the prospecting licenses, you have the mining licenses in respect of um, gold and other minerals, which is also undergoing validation in the Ashanti region. I see. Now, I mean, this is just public information. When mm -hmm. you go onto the website of the Minerals Commission, you'll find this. But what we also found out... Mm -hmm. is the fact i mean this has been an ongoing conversation you recall somewhere in may june there was so much talk about mining and forest reserves True. so that the um, the environmental protection agency had mm -hmm. cause to complain that it was alarming how many entry permits were granted mining companies to go into forest reserves Absolutely. that was upon the request by the forestry commission for some mining companies to have been given entry permits mm -hmm. Now, in that particular letter, where the, where the um, Environmental Protection Agency raised that concern, mm -hmm. they attached as many as 47 forest reserves that mining companies had gone into to explore for minerals. 47? Yes, 47. And in the list of the 47, we had number 43 being High Street Limited. In fact, let, let, let's expand that because um, it, it now gives us a, a clear idea of the extent of this attempt to get into forest reserves. Yes. According to the EPA's own document, companies had applied to mine in 47 forest, forest reserves, reserves in yes. this country. And then the Forestry Commission had given them entry permits or had requested the EPA to give them entry permits. And that was when EPA raised the alarm to say that within the space of one year, that was mm -hmm. between February 2018 and February 2019, 47 entry permits had been granted to mining companies to go into forest reserves. 
the one that was granted to High Street Limited in respect of entry was um, Subin Shelter Belt. The Subin Shelter Belt. This is around in um, Nimeriso? Yes. Uh, this is in, the, in Bekwai, in, in the Ashanti region. Precisely so. I see. But then, before the EPA raised that concern, they had acknowledged that it's not exactly the case that you are not allowed to mine in um, forest reserves, mm -hmm. except that there are guidelines as to how to go about it. The EPA took the pain to explain the guidelines. And even though it talks about some 2%, that 2% has often been misconstrued to, to mean that 2% of all the forest reserve is allowed to be used for mining purposes. But no, on a careful read of the guidelines, which I'll show pretty soon, which is here, mm -hmm. what this 2% actually means is that all the forest reserves have been divided into three parts. I see. We have the protection part, which right. means that this part is not touchable. Okay. You have the production part, which means that it's only allowed for timber extraction. And then there's another part they call a conversion part, which are areas which are targeted for replanting. Mm -hmm. Now, this 2% in question only applies to the production parts of the entire forest reserve. I see. Just that 2%. Yes. Yeah, so, so when they say 2% of the forest reserve, the production part of the forest reserve is allowed for purposes of mining per the guidelines. Okay. It does not mean the entire guidelines. It only, I mean, the entire forest reserve. So nobody will be right to say, okay. There's mining allowed in forest reserves. So no, it's only 2% of the production parts of the forest reserve. Interesting. And we saw all these things when that conversation came up. Mm -hmm. So it is not the case that this is the first time a company is making an attempt to go into a forest reserve. No, because we have seen as many as 47 of them in the space of one year go into forest reserve to explore for minerals. Wow. It is also the case that this high street company is in here for the first time. No, mm -hmm. we have seen their operations, we have seen them um, enter into a forest reserve before for exploration. Mm -hmm. So this is not the first time they are making an attempt to go into a forest reserve, except this time we are now told by the Mineral Commission that their application was rejected. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, the CEOs who have raised the concern about the, 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 the risk that uh, Kakum National Park stands to, 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 to be taken away by the mining companies. But, but, but think about it this way, Dennis. I mean, this is Kakum National Park for that matter. I don't know if, if while you were in the primary school, uh, you ever went for excursion at the Kakum National Park, but I did. You know, we, we paid at the time. It's always it been one of the places that we all look forward so. to going, and especially when you Absolutely. see pictures of people go there and they, ride, they, they walk on the canopy walkway. And it, it, it makes interesting, interesting feel sometimes. So even the thought of a mining company wanting to even apply for a license to mine in Kakum, that's what beats the mind of many. But Dennis, really appreciate this solid background that you're giving to, to this conversation. It sets the premise for a lot of thinking as to what has to be done going forward. Daryl Bosu is a, a deputy director of Arocha Ghana Environmental Agency. They, they are one of four CSOs that blew the alarm on this matter even before the uh, Minerals Commission issued this letter denying that they had granted a license to any company prospecting or whatever to go into the Kakum National Park. Daryl is with us in studio. Daryl, it's good to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Does, the, does the Minerals Commission's letter denying the granting any lease to, to mine in the Kakum National Park to this High Street Limited answer the questions that you have? Well, Alfred, I think it's very interesting, and I want to, if you allow me, mm -hmm. to pick it from where Dennis left off. Mm -hmm. So all this information of the 47 um, concessions and application was between 2018 and 2019. Thereafter, 